So it's hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which part of the world that you're in. And uh, it's my pleasure. Um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of information about myself in a minute, but it, it's a great pleasure to introduce you to our, our webinar today on key food safety trends in 2023. And, and the question that we hope we will be able to answer for you is, what are the top 10 emerging risks that AI models can predict? So in terms of artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, how important a tool could those be for all of us going forward in terms of really trying to understand what's coming along the road? Because there, there is a huge and massive difference in terms of presenting food safety crisis and a food safety crisis well and we, and we all know that there's a wide range of measures that have been implemented on prevention of uh, food safety incidents but we all know that they still occur and, and you know the question is why does this happen Human error will always play an important role, but we have to look to much wider food, uh, food systems uh, issues, uh, potentially new risks emerging in areas or commodities that hadn't been seen previously, emerging risks caused by changes in agricultural practices and manufacturing practices, and of course, shocks to our food supply chains. And, and we've had several of those you know, over the past uh, few years in terms of the pandemic, in terms of the war in Ukraine, but also the, big, the bigger item ar around our climate crisis. So these factors really should make food safety professionals worried. And, and the fact that we have got many hundreds of food safety professionals are, are now yeah, participating in our webinar, I think that's absolutely correct. So what we want to discuss during this webinar is new ways of thinking about moving from crisis management to crisis prevention. And that's through the, the exploitation of data. Next slide, please. What I'd like to do is think about how we can use AI and predictive analytics. But for those people who are unsure what it, what it really means and whether you can trust these or not. Some people are very skeptical. Some people have been very early adopters in this. And what we're going to see today is a number of case studies that I hope will convince you and certainly convince me that this is absolutely the right direction of travel in terms of, of trying to predict issues from happening in the future. So it's my great pleasure to introduce a, a wonderful panel that has been put together. So uh, not so wonderful is me. My name is Chris Elliott. I'm Professor of Food Safety at Queen's University, Belfast. And I've been involved in, 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 in detecting, monitoring, and, and dealing with food safety incidents for a very, very long time. It's my pleasure to uh, uh, introduce Vera Petrova Dickinson, who has an unbelievable experience in working in so many different food businesses and, and, and beyond food businesses in, in, in terms of uh, trying to deal with the, the massive issues of, of food safety. Our, our, our next panelist is Richard Stadler, who Richard, uh, I've known for a long time, and we have sat and talked about quite a lot of food crisis over the years. So I don't, yeah. think, there's, you know, I, I don't think there's anybody better than Richard in terms of thinking about global issues that suddenly appear uh, and, and there didn't seem to be any particular warning about them either. And our, our, our fourth panelist is, is uh, uh, Giannis Stoikis, who is Chief Technology Officer and a partner at Agronomy that I've worked with for several years now. And I, I heard their technology, their ways of doing things, really, really very impressive. So, Giannis, I'm going to hand over to you now, and you can maybe take us through the next section of our webinar. Thank you so much, Chris, and I would like also to thank you uh, all for joining, for your interest in this uh, webinar, and uh, thank you in advance for your time. Uh, so uh, I will 
make a very short intro about what we are doing, how we are doing it, uh, and then I will uh, hand over again, uh, Chris, to you so you can uh, post the most important questions that you would like to be answered uh, together with the other panelists, with the great panelists that we have today. Uh, so some some things, some few things about uh, Agrono. Agrono is we are the data and analytics company that uh, uses AI to predict food safety risks. Uh, the promise, uh, what we are promising to the partners and the organizations that we are working with, the food companies that we are working with, is uh, to provide a reliable, a reliable risk forecasting for critical raw materials and ingredients uh, by uh, thoroughly using thoroughly tested and accurate AI models. Uh, we are measuring what this promise and what we are delivering by monitoring continuously which is the prediction accuracy of each deployed model, but also uh, by monitoring how many of the market recalls that have been uh, uh, that have been announced and uh, they have hit the the market uh, the market have been early highlighted as an emerging risk uh, by our models. So working with many food companies and many large brands, what we hear as a main concern uh, when we are discussing about the AI technology and the use of AI technology and how this technology can address the very important challenges that we have in the food safety uh, and food integrity in general, the main concern that we hear is uh, if we can really trust uh, these AI models. Uh, and the other thing that we are uh, that we hear and we are discussing a lot uh, is that uh, people uh, are saying that they don't understand, the experts are don't, uh, they don't understand how these models work. So the confidence uh, for these models is not so high, especially if you cannot understand them. So uh, we we believe, and it's very important for us, it's, an, it's a priority to deliver uh, these new technologies, the, the results of the AI models in a simple and easy way, in a, in a way that uh, can be trusted, it can be explained by the uh, experts. Uh, so we have uh, developed AI models and we have delivered them through uh, dashboards, through live dashboards. And the main goal of these dashboards is to answer the question uh, about which are the emerging food safety trends in the global landscape that we should keep an eye on. And to do so, we, are, uh, we have developed a methodology for uh, deploying such models, uh, which is tailor-made uh, each time to the specific ingredient, the specific region, and specific hazards that may be linked and may affect uh, the ingredients and the raw materials uh, that uh, we are sourcing from different, that the companies are sourcing from different regions. Uh, so the first step of this methodology is to create a tailor-made data set uh, for each ingredient. Uh, and then uh, the next step is to understand very well which is the question that we want to answer. And uh, based on this question, to select the best uh, machine learning, the best AI approach that can provide an answer to the business question, to the problem that we are trying to solve. After that, we have an iterative process uh, of uh, parameterizing uh, the machine learning algorithms, of training and testing uh, the uh, deployed, the, the developed models. Uh, because the main goal there is eventually to deploy the best performing model uh, using the data that we have at hand, but also uh, to uh, having uh, as a, a very important thing to answer the question that uh, we need, that we want uh, to provide a solution to. So uh, the, the methodology, the goal of this methodology is to actually taking the different parameters that we may have in a model to be able to deploy the best performing model uh, through a dashboard. 
following this methodology, we have been able to, during the last three years uh, to forecast uh, some of the important increasing uh, trends, increasing risks or emerging risks uh, in the market. Uh, so I have some of the examples of this uh, uh, successful use cases uh, that we have also presented in previous webinars. So the one use case is that we have forecasted very early uh, the increasing, the highly increasing trend of ethylene oxide in sesame seeds, but also in herbs and spices, uh, which was an issue that uh, was a very important issue that dominated the, uh, the year of 2021. Uh, but it started from uh, 2020 and we had early signals uh, for using for uh, ETO in herbs and spices from 2012 and 2014. So we used this information in order to highlight that there will be such an increasing trend in the market, in the industry. The second case is uh, the prediction of uh, the increase increased trend for salmonella in chocolate products, which was forecasted uh, in October 2021, uh, six months before uh, we had these uh, many, many incidents uh, announced uh, uh, about uh, salmonella in chocolate products, not only uh, in, the, in Europe, but also in the United States. And uh, a very recent case is that uh, based on the uh, information and the trends that we are and the data that we are collecting uh, for heavy metals in different ingredients, in different materials like cocoa, uh, our models highlighted uh, in May 2022 uh, that uh, there is an increasing trend for uh, cadmium in cocoa. And uh, a couple of months ago, in December 2022, we had the first consumer reports and lawsuits to companies regarding uh, the, uh, uh, the occurrence of heavy metals in chocolate products, in Finnish chocolate products. Of course, there are also crises that have gone under the radar of uh, AI models. And uh, I have also some examples here, some cases here. I will explain later on why this may happen, uh, that we may miss an important uh, uh, issue in the industry. So one such example is uh, a new risk, an unknown risk that uh, uh, was linked to uh, the peanut traces in soy lecithin, uh, which was last year, uh, but also the case of ETO, which expanded to other uh, food categories like food additives. This was not something that was forecasted. And actually this created a, an important issue for ice cream uh, products, uh, but also the very recent Swedish egg uh, salmonella outbreak that is uh, right now active. These are examples of cases that have gone under the radar of AI models. And as I mentioned later on during this presentation, I will explain when this may happen. So, Chris, I will hand over again back to you after this short intro about what we are doing and how we are doing it. Uh, so, I am very, I'm looking forward and very eager to hear which are the key questions that we would like to answer. Which, what is very important for the, our participants today, but also for our panelists. Thank you, Janice. <clears throat> and. Um... Already there has been some questions have started to come into the chat box, which is fantastic. And please feel free to keep asking your questions. We'll have a dedicated slot in terms of, of a Q&A session, not only for the panelists, but also for our participants. So type your questions in. Now, one of the uh, pieces of homework participants were asked to do was to complete a, a questionnaire. And, and, and the questionnaire, part of it was around where, where do you think the biggest risks lie in terms of, of, of future food safety incidents? And, and what we have here is um, uh, from, from small numbers in terms of, of things like poultry and meat, right up to uh, the very serious issues around things like cereal and bakery products. Now, 
when 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 myself and Janice, when, when we started to really analyze this data, because we you know we 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 like to analyze data in a huge amount of detail, I found it incredibly interesting, because what I do is I've got my own systems for collecting information, interrogating information, and and and. and forming my own, I would call it a risk register in terms of emerging issues. And what I found was that a lot of parallels between the risks that I was picking up and the participants were as well, particularly around serials. And for a lot of that, to me, was coming from massive issues about, about the massive disruption in, in supply chains around the world because of what's happening in, in Ukraine and Russia. What I was, I was personally surprised at the second ranking um, um, risk was put down as milk and milk products, which I was not picking up. And I'm really interested to find out why that might be the case. How, how is my data sources you know, lacking in that? And that might be a, a, a subject for discussion for later on. But we can see from this, you know, some of the things that Janice talked about, herbs and spices, massive issues and ongoing issues there. Oils and fats, again, really big issues about, about uh, supply and demand because of all of the uh, uh, supply chain shocks there. So I think I think it's a really very, very good and very insightful list of, of what's going on. So perhaps we can go to the next slide now. So now what I would like to do is to invite Vera, if you would like to come in and, and you talk about um, using predictive analytics to build stronger supplier and, and, and material controls. Yes, thank you, Chris. And thank you for inviting me today to this wonderful panel. As you know, I'm a huge believer in AI and predictive analytics, have been for many years. Uh, and you may ask me why. I really truly believe this is going to be a game changer for food safety and quality risk management and for our better decision making in business. And I have a few questions as a business leader on how do we make stronger and better decisions in the area of supplier quality management or material controls. First question that comes to mind is what are some of the regional food safety risks that may be impacting materials or suppliers in my network? This really will drive some decisions around analytical performance requirements that we may be enforcing on suppliers for materials or additional verifications, verification practices for suppliers, for example, increased audits. Next. What are some of the slowly brewing emerging food safety hazards that may be impacting global food safety internal food safety strategies? So I may decide that with the new emerging risk, I need to invest in a better piece of equipment in my lab, or maybe I need to hire a, an additional food safety expert to, to have on staff. Um, another question that pops in mind is, well, can I actually anticipate future supplier or material performance so I can make decisions on a long-term relationship with my suppliers? Or perhaps we want to have conversations with R&D on reformulation of a product that may be using a material that is predicting to be not performing to our standards. And finally, I'm sure as many of you, you, you probably had the same issue as I have for, for the last two to three years due to COVID implications on supply chain. Can we be one step ahead of potential material shortages? And really this information will drive meaningful discussions with procurement on the diversification of supply base. These are just some of the questions that I have in my mind. Now, now over to you, Richard. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Vera. Hello to you all, and it's a great pleasure for me to be on the panel. So um, essentially, just to um, second on what Vera said, I, I think uh, it's really essential that we, we try and exploit all the available data we have. In our unit, we use machine learning to consolidate, aggregate, and connect data. And basically, uh, these algorithms are used to translate input data in, into priorities based on occurrence of hazards in the different materials. Now, if you look at the first two points I've put in down here in terms of uh, some questions we would like to, to answer, 
Um, the one is about risk. I mean, we see a lot about hazards, but what is the real risk from a safety, compliance, and even reputational perspective? And um, I've added here also, are these models sufficiently granular? Also going into the, the second point there, because we see a lot of advances in the sciences as we go along, new research. And one thing models probably need to do is get deeper into the data, extracting it from tables, which is a little bit more difficult, maybe supplementary material. Do they consider, for example, risk assessment data, exposure data? So you're getting into that mode of risk, which is, I think, very essential here because a hazard could be there. You're seeing it, it's happening, but is it really equating into something which is of a, of a greater concern? And then staying on the granular tree, I think there as well, a lot of the issues, and you talked about ethylene oxide, a lot of it happens locally or regionally. And of course, that can spread. We've got global supply chains. And so suddenly it'll pop up in, in many regions, particularly when you're buying materials and produce from a supplier producing in a certain country. So there again, it's not simple to, to understand the hazards, but you have to basically then rate those hazards differently in the materials from a low rating to a higher rating, depending on where uh, the issue is happening and how broad that issue is across your, your supply chain. And one thing, models as well, models need data. You need to have it there. And sometimes you, you won't have that data. And the third point there I've put down is about correlating associated data on climate change. So we all know this. It could be linked maybe to mycotoxins, soil, water quality. But I'm thinking now of an example, thinking of poly and perfluoroalkylated substances, the PFAS, we call them. Now, if you look at that, we have today a lot of changes in the regulation. I'll talk about that in a minute on, on the fourth point. But um, what we're seeing here is we don't have maybe have a lot of data in, in the foods and maybe just looking at water data and soil data and occurrence data and usage of PFAS in the industries. So if you have a food manufacturer or you have a farm close to something which is more industrial or usage, you may have water contaminated and you're using basically industrial water, municipal water uh, or process water in your, in your unit, in your facility, then you could contaminate your food product. So having that one data set, which would be basically water, you could translate it into a food stuff potentially. So, so basically connecting those nodes and doing that interconnection of data is really essential for these, uh, these tools and these models to do. And the last point on singles in the regulatory landscape, that's a, a quagmire. I mean, you know, we don't want to go into that too detailed, but staying in on the, on the PFAS example now, uh, we have regulatory changes coming up in the um, in the EU. We have the EPA on health advisory levels, where you're going into the part per quadrillion level. First, you know, we talk part per billion, uh, maybe in our days part per million, 30 years ago, I mean, three decades in this, now in quality and food safety. Now we're talking you know, PPQ. So we've got to go to four PPQ for, for one of these substances. Again, what does it mean? It means labs can't even measure. And so how, how are we going to manage that with, uh, with AI and data to understand how to connect and how to react because you'll see more issues popping up. So your models will see creation of certain trends and uh, we're gonna to have to mitigate. We're gonna to have to be able to understand how we're gonna manage it from our side, from an industry side. So these are all the challenges and uh, maybe I'm putting too much on the table here what I expect models in the future to do, but what you've already shown is really nice trends and uh, trends which are very, very pertinent and very helpful for us. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, many thanks, Vera, very much. Thanks, Richard. I mean, some really insightful information and, you know, lots of questions coming from both of you as well, which I think is phenomenal, really good. And, and again, questions are starting to come into the chat box. Please feel free to, uh, to ask them. What, what I will do is the really most difficult questions, uh, Janice, you just get ready. I'll put them in your direction, okay? <laughs> so I think in terms of... Uh, Food safety trends, the AI forecasts, perhaps, Jenna, you can tell us now what you think now, based on, on the algorithms that, that now have developed, what do you think really the, uh, the key issues that we're, we're going to face into are? Thank you so much, Chris. So it's, yeah, I have... A we all have a very hard work to do. There are many questions and uh, they, are, they are very interesting. All the aspects are really, really interesting. So I will try to share here what uh, AI models are forecasting for uh, 2023 uh, for the main categories uh, of, uh, that are of concern uh, for all of us, for, the, for us here in the panel, but also for the participant. So uh, I uh, one challenge was 
how to present all these categories, the trends for all these categories. So, so uh, we have created here a, a table that is summarizing the main issues for the categories. I will uh, highlight some of these uh, issues. Of course, there will be a recording, so at any point you can you can uh, stop here and you can you can check them in detail. And I will highlight mainly uh, those. Uh, categories that you have mentioned that are very important for you and that are of concern for the next year. So for milk and milk products, uh, what uh, the AI models that we are deploying are saying uh, in, a, in, the, in this tailor-made approach that we are following is that uh, there will be an increase of a known risk in this uh, industry, uh, which is the case of Listeria. Uh, uh, but uh, there are also emerging risks like the case of Chronobacter that have been highlighted and have been pointed out uh, by uh, the AI models for 2023. And, uh, and trying to answer this uh, on how we can have this risk to be regional and to, to, to have a good granularity of the risk, the models are also focusing uh, and uh, they are providing information about for which geographies we will have high uh, risk uh, for this specific uh, category. So this is, in this case, this is the United States, France, and Mexico. Uh, for cereals and bakery, I have uh, I will analyze far, far further the results of the AI models in my next slide. So I will not. Uh, comment uh, these uh, risks here uh, and I will the same stands for herbs and spices so I will go to fats and oils uh, in fats and oils yet yeah, there is this very important issue right now during the uh, the, the Ukraine war and all the the problems that we have in this region uh, so there are uh, some three very important issues that have been highlighted as an increasing risks for the next months. And this is uh, the use of uh, um, colors like uh, Sudan 4 and, uh, and the ethylene oxide, pesticides like ethylene oxide. Uh, and one of the emerging issues uh, that have that are uh, is highlighted by the models is uh, the presence of uh, mineral oil uh, in uh, fats and oils. Uh, and of course, this is at the level of category, but of, uh, can be also drilled down to specific uh, oils and fats. In the case of oils, it can be sunflower oil or it can be also palm oil. So the models can also provide answers at this granularity because I, mm. I, I heard also the point of granularity, which is very important. And in terms of the geographies, the most risky uh, regions for uh, this kind, for this uh, category of ingredients and materials uh, are the regions like Ghana and uh, Syria. Uh, for nuts and, and seeds, for cocoa, I will have, I will further analyze it in, in my slides later on. For nuts and seeds, uh, the models are predicting an increasing risk for aflatoxin, but also the presence uh, of uh, ETO, mainly in seeds. Uh, but uh, we will have also emerging issues with some uh, uh, pesticides that have been identified for the first time to be exceeding the limits uh, that I'm uh, showing here in this uh, slide. And uh, Geographies with high risk profile here are uh, the United States, but also India and China. Uh, and for fruits and vegetables, uh, the models are predicting uh, an increasing risk <clears throat> for pesticides and aflatoxin. Uh, and here we have again the emerging risk for mineral oil uh, in uh, fruits and vegetables. And uh, the regions with uh, high risk uh, profile. In this case, in the case of fruits and vegetables, are Turkey, China, and the United States. As I mentioned, I will further analyze the case of uh, some of the food categories that were very important uh, based on the uh, on the questions that we had uh, from uh, the panelists, but also based on the on the preferences and the interests of the participants. 
So I will start with uh, the results with some more details uh, about the forecasted risks for cereals and bakery products. In the case of cereals and bakery products, uh, you can see on the on the top left uh, si uh, side of this uh, slide, we can see which is the trend of the incidence and which is the predicted trend of the incidence, the forecasted trend of the incident. But also we can see uh, a, a line, uh, a curve that is uh, showing uh, which is how the model performed in the last 12 months. So we can also uh, see which was the performance. And we see here that it was very difficult to, to catch, to, to model this uh, high peak that we had uh, for in serials during the, uh, at the beginning of 2022. But in general, the accuracy of the model is quite good. It's at the level of 75%. Uh, and uh, the, the way that it predicts the trend uh, it's uh, is uh, very close to the actual trend that we had during this period, uh, and for the next period, the trend, uh, the forecasted trend, uh, is that the incident, the level of the incidents, will be quite the same. However, although we will have uh, a high level of incidents, but with no increasing trend for cereals. Uh, we will have some hazards that are likely to increase, to increase, and uh, this is uh, mainly the case of uh, pesticides. So uh, there are uh, the the models are predicting that there will we will have more issue with the use of uh, pesticides in cereals. Uh, in terms of the regions, uh, the most uh, the risky geographies uh, based on the AI models uh, will be the United States, but also Mexico and India for cereals. Always we are talking for cereals here. Let's go and see also the results for herbs and spices, as I promised. So for herbs and spices, again, we can see which, uh, how uh, our models are predicting the trend. So as you can see, uh, during the last uh, year, uh, 2022, and 2021, we have a high level of incidents already. So the, the number of the incidents is at the higher level than in previous years. So this th trend, uh, based on according to our models, will remain. And the performance of the model, uh, specifically for herbs and spices, because this is a model that it has been developed only for herbs and spices using global uh, data. Uh, has a good performance. The accuracy is uh, at, uh, uh, the accuracy is at eighty-one percent, a bit more than eighty-one percent. And the main hazards that uh, our models predict that will increase during the next months uh, are uh, pesticides, uh, salmonella, uh, but also the case of ETO, the ethylene oxide. will still we will still have more issues uh, with ethylene oxide for herbs and spices. One of the very interesting uh, cases that I mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, in the successful cases at the beginning of this presentation, is the case of uh, heavy metals in uh, chocolate products, in cocoa and chocolate products. And uh, here I would like to, with the results, I would like to answer the question that Richard uh, made about correlating different associated data and correlating different and using different data types in order to confirm or to identify increasing trend. And uh, uh, this is, uh, I will try to answer this in this specific use case. So what we have uh, done here is that uh, we have used Two different data types. Right. Uh, one types of one type of information that we have used to estimate the risk during the last for more than ten years uh, was the global incidents that we have, the frequency of the incidents, and the other type of information, type of data that we have used, is the frequency of heavy metals occurrence that are above the limit of quantification in cocoa. Uh, so as we can see here, this is a, the plot, the graph, the chart of a overall risk using these two associated data types. Uh, the overall risk in 
of heavy metals in cocoa and chocolate products during the last 10 years uh, is highly increasing. And also the, the AI models uh, are predicting that there will still we will still have this increase during the, the next 12 months. And if we go uh, and try to explain why this is happening, and uh, uh, we, we can, if we focus and see which are the insights from the global incidents point of view, so we will see that uh, after 2016, the frequency of these uh, incidents of uh, having heavy metals in cocoa or in Finnish in chocolate products uh, were uh, increased by 360%. So this very important increase. And if we see, uh, if we do the similar analysis for the occurrence uh, of the heavy metals in cocoa uh, using global uh, lab test results uh, for concentration of heavy metals, we will see again that the number of the cocoa samples in which the concentration of heavy metals were found above the limit of quantification has doubled in the last uh, five years. Uh, and uh, uh, this was mainly due that the high peaks that we have in this in the concentration that was measured was mainly due uh, to the presence of cadmium in cocoa. And uh, I would like also go one step further and answer the question for the regional for the regional risk eh, for the granularity of this model. Can we see for which regions uh, for, for cocoa from which regions we have higher risk? Doing uh, using all this data and uh, are using uh, deploying AI models. Uh, we have identified that the high risk regions are uh, based on the data that we have uh, is Ecuador and uh, also Colombia, uh, and this will increase during the next months. So this is how the risk that we are estimating, which can be the overall, overall risk, can give us a very good idea of how the risk will increase overall for a specific material. Uh, and then for, for a specific hazard, for a specific issue like heavy metals, this can be also become very specific and point out to us from which regions we have high risk for this specific material. So one, one of the questions that we receive very frequently, very often uh, when we talk with, uh, with the companies that we are working with or with the organizations or working with is uh, what we can do with this knowledge. So we were one of the, uh, we are sharing here some of the most important things that we have agreed uh, all that uh, uh, this is a very important knowledge and that we can use this knowledge in order to communicate the risk inside internally in an organization uh, to share this knowledge uh, in a fast way. Uh, so not only the food safety departments and food quality departments, but also procurement departments know about this uh, uh, this uh, emerging issue. Uh, we can also use this knowledge uh, to proactively adjust supplier practices, but also we can adjust some specific preventive measures like the, the testing plans uh, that we have or the audit plan that we, we have. Uh, and in some cases, we may also use this information to make a very hard decision about changing uh, suppliers you know, and using suppliers from other regions with less risk for this specific uh, uh, material. As I mentioned at the first part of the presentation, there are also uh, crises that have gone and will go under the radar of the AI models. And this, we have tried to identify and point out here when this may happen. Uh, usually, what, uh, when uh, we cannot be, we cannot predict things is in cases when we are talking about really new and unknown risk uh, for which we there is no uh, previous knowledge 
uh, no reports announced, no uh, research uh, studies, uh, no research results, uh, no regulation, uh, regulatory framework. So this is something very, uh, very difficult. Uh, I will not count the case of PFAS uh, in that, uh, based on the based on your comment, Richard, because uh, PFAS we have already some data for PFAS. And I think that the regulatory framework is trying to uh, to provide an answer to this uh, in, increased risk that uh, the the data uh, are are highlighting. Uh, also, it's very difficult. Another case in which it's very difficult to predict things is is that we cannot predict uh, in many cases the social and economic situation in specific regions. So we cannot predict how the GDP of specific region will go, uh, because this this has this is dependent on on many many different parameters. It's a very complex uh, thing. Uh, so we can use this as a parameters. As, a, as to correlate this data, this associated data about the uh, the risk, the country risk that we have based on the socio-economic situation, but not to predict this situation. It's very hard to predict this situation. We can use this uh, this uh, parameter as risk drivers. This uh, parameters as risk drivers uh, that may increase the likelihood of uh, a risk for a specific material. Uh, it's also uh, something that is very, very much linked to what I have explained uh, with the socio-economic situation, with predicting the socio-economic situation, is that uh, it's very hard to predict events that are dependent on many different parameters that cannot be predicted. So th this is something, uh, when, when we have a chaotic situation, it's very difficult to, to predict something. And if we have again some new behavior of people on how they handle an ingredient or how they handle how they are behaving in a processing, uh, in the processing uh, framework or in a processing, uh, uh, when they they are part of the processing of the food, this is something that is very difficult if we have no data of such uh, behavior before. So these are these are the points uh, and these are the cases in which. We cannot provide questions using the AI models based on our experience so far. I, I think that some of this uh, of the, the technology will get more mature. We will get some more data, and we will be able uh, also to provide questions for some of these cases. And with that, I will hand over back to you, Chris. So we have a, a reflection by you, the panelists, but also. Uh, questions by audience. Yeah, thanks again, Yanis. Um, I have to say there's lots and lots of questions coming in, really good questions. So I think that's uh, fantastic. And please, please keep typing your questions into the Q&A box. And, and, and while you're gathering your thoughts together, maybe uh, I'll, I'll just turn to Vera again, just to think about, you know, from what you've heard, but also from your, you know, your, 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 your knowledge in this area, what your reflections are in terms of the uh, robustness of these predictions. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris. Great session so far, really a lot of learnings. And like I said, I love this topic. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of thoughts. Um, AI is, of course, a very powerful um, tool, but it is just that. It's, it's just a tool. It certainly has been unlocking things that we couldn't or um, cannot as a human, as human beings do, right? So in particular with the amount of information that is coming at us. But um, I have to to just encourage everyone that no matter what predictions um, AI may be driving or, or proposing to you, it's still merely an input. Like with any forecast, you still have to have robust internal discussions on what your final recommend, business recommendations should be. As Yanis mentioned, there's so many contributing factors that may change your direction, right? It's the geopolitical scenario that you didn't expect or maybe changes with your supplier organizational structure or something else that's happening that 
AI simply would not be able to, to pick up. So to me, if I were to drive a comparison, um, if you look at this picture, AI is basically like the light that's shining through really thick forest. It's just showing you the direction that you need to go, uh, you go into, but your really path, you and your business partner partners need to define what that looks like. So it's a great tool, but it's not the answer that is not the final answer for everything. Richard? Thank you, Vera. Yeah, thank you, Vera. I absolutely. I mean, it's, I think it's AI. This is one element in the toolkit of early warning that, that we have and that we really can exploit. So, um, yeah, for some reflections, you know, we, we have a lot of data out there and uh, this we have to definitely use better interconnected data, as I, I said before, uh, identify signals and, and trends. Um, but overall, you know, it, it's really key at one point still to have the expert available because there is a lot of knowledge there and there still has to be a human judgment on those on those predictions and I think that's that's really it's really key so what needs to be filtered out can it be filtered out and is, is it reliable using some of the data that you, you find there in the science or in in the web you, you still can question some of it so it needs a critical eye in, in my opinion but I think that's something we we need to definitely factor in um, the point on, on source data and reliability, that's exactly what I, what I just said. Verification, again, it's going to cost resources. How much do you want to invest in that to, to verify? But I think it's key. Um, some of it can be done very quickly. Other things will need to be, you know, they will take more time. It might even end up in, in a program, particularly if you, you're sourcing in different places and you've got to dig deeper. And uh, that might, uh, might be... Uh, Yes, necessary, required. And so also, you know, you're looking at uh, decisions which uh, are in real time. So you've got to react fast as well. And I think that's, uh, that's also uh, of, uh, of key importance. On, um, on the surprising issues, I mean, what, what I've seen here and what you've shown, I mean, there's topics which are clearly re-emerging. Um, as I said, you got so much data there, plethora of data. We we sometimes even with those with the cadmium, with, with salmonella, and with, with things uh, you've highlighted, minerals, etc. We, we tend sometimes to forget, you know, even and we don't understand what the new triggers are. Um, is it uh, based on the material? Is it based on the sourcing country where things have changed in agricultural practices, or have they changed in manufacturing practices? So I think that's uh, that's important also uh, to follow up and not forget those and don't put them out in you know into isolation or, or forget them. So this is really key that we keep uh, monitoring them as you've, you've just shown. So uh, yeah, those would be, these would be my reflections. Yeah, <clears throat> th th thanks very much, Vera and Richard again, because I think those reflections are really important and, and they overlap a great deal with, with mine as well. And, and I think I'll take the chair's prerogative and not spend time of me talking. I would much rather now to get the audience participation because there's some really good questions coming in here. And, and unfortunately, Giannis, most of them are for you about the data that you have presented. Now, what I'm, again, there are multiple questions and apologies if I can't deal with all of them. There, there's just a couple, and I, I think I know the answers to them. And if I'm correct, Janice, you just say yes, or, or if you want to add to it. I mean, one of the questions is about the granularity of the data. And, and you talked about um, potentially based based on what the, uh, the the forecasts are showing you changing suppliers, but I don't think your 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 data is granular to suppliers. It's about countries where people source things from, and then you would have to think about changing your supplier that sources from a different geographical region. Is that a correct interpretation? Yeah, it's very correct. We have also data for suppliers, uh, but most of the data are, uh, have the source, uh, the, the origin country of the material, of the ingredients. But we have also, most of the incidents that we have 
uh, they are also linked to suppliers. So we can project these predictions, this forecast, this risk forecast also to suppliers. Thanks for that. Now, I'm, I'm trying to combine a couple of questions here because it is about the various sources of data that you use and, and they're asking what, what, what are your sources of data and as you increase your data sources the amount of testing that goes on is increasing or actually you're just picking up trends and more testing rather than food safety trends itself so perhaps to try to cover those collectively yes so that's a, a great question because uh, we are the ones we belong to the group of the people that we very much believe first in data and then in what's the what the models the AI models can predict using this data so we are expanding continuously the data in different data types to cover also different types of information that are there and are linked to parameters, to risk drivers that may increase the risks for specific uh, ingredients and materials, uh, but also for the uh, information types that we have already, for the data types that we have already, like the incidents or the laboratory testing data, we are continuously adding new data sources, new countries that are publishing information. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have uh, a growth of, uh, of the data of the data set that of this large harmonized data that we are data set that we are creating uh, that is at least 10 percent every year uh, and this is actually very helpful because having better data we are we all understand that we are very dependent on the data uh, the models ai models cannot predict cannot forecast cannot be built cannot be tested if we don't have data if we don't have good data so the increase of this data uh, is uh, of great importance also to improve the performance of the AI models. And yeah, we are always talking about not only about collecting the data, downloading the data, but also about harmonizing all this different data, which is hard work, but it can be done. There are technologies that you can utilize and can solve this issue. Thanks for that. There, there's a number of questions about um, uh, will you supply um, CPD certificates? And I'm quite sure you're, you'll, you'll be doing that to all of the participants, a very important part of uh, our professional careers. And also some people are saying, will the presentation, will it be available online? And again, the answer to that is yes, absolutely. This will be, this will be streamed for quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, there is, I guess, probably one of the best questions because it's the question I ask myself quite regularly. I think, Richard, Vera, you will ask yourself the same question. What's going to be the next big scandal? What is going to be the next crisis of a scale of melamine? And, and you know, is that something that can or cannot be predicted? Do you want the specific uh, scandal or do you want... <laughs> to answer the question of if it can be predicted or not. So, I mean, I, I guess if we all knew what the next melamine scandal is, we, we wouldn't be on the webinar. We would be doing other things, getting ready for it. So yeah. I think in terms of, I, I think a better question is, or, or, or perhaps more fitting to the data, can you predict the level of the crisis that might happen based on the red and the red flags that you are identifying you know you know to me a, a problem with a with a with a, a mycotoxin is a kind of one type of risk but if you're finding a, a, a campylobacter in, in 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 food products and the numbers are rising that that's a completely different scale event so can you scale the 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 the, the, the severity of of the potential incidents yeah, th this is what we can do. So we can mm -hmm. we can estimate and we can anticipate which how how big will be this increasing trend. Uh, so, for instance, even for mycotoxins, if uh, uh, the mycotoxins uh, due to the climate conditions, due to the climate change, will increase a lot due, uh, during the for the next couple of years, and we have the data for the climate change and the data for 
uh, for uh, early incidents uh, with uh, mycotoxin. This is something that uh, for sure it can be uh, predicted by the models. Uh, this, this is something that uh, can be done. Uh, also, something that can be uh, forecasted is some uh, new uh, issues, new hazards that have been identified sporadically, but uh, they are uh, affecting uh, broadly different types of uh, foods, but there is an underlying connection uh, based on the regions uh, or based on the conditions uh, that uh, these uh, ingredients or materials have been uh, produced. So this is again cases that we can uh, uh, model and we can predict well uh, with AI models. But still, your point is very good that we are very much dependent on data. So we can we cannot build uh, models if we don't have the data. Uh, so if and there are there are a lot of data out there. Uh, they need to be collected, harmonized, and there are also a lot of data internally in the food company. So we need to unlock also this sharing of data between sharing of private data in an anonymous way that can be used by the model to forecast the next very important scandal. Yeah, thank, thanks again for that. I mean, there, there are lots and lots of more questions and, and I think we are running out of time. So I'm, I'm going to ask you another question because it was the same question that I had in my mind because you talked about things that went under the radar screen and that's, you, you explained it very well. What about things that you predict are going to be a problem that actually aren't a problem and how many times will you raise red flags and, and you know companies and businesses will put lots of efforts into trying to deal with something but it doesn't materialize i will start with the second uh, the second part of the if your question which is uh, about how we can and we are discussing a lot this with uh, with the companies that we are working with how we can become and how we can help the companies become more agile when they see an increasing uh, risk and uh, how they can uh, be uh, how they can confirm this increasing trend and how they can activate the preventive measures so this is something that we, we are discussing a lot uh, there is a this is one of the very important things because we hear about mineral oil we hear about heavy metals but we are not doing we know about that we see also the predictions but we are not doing any uh, actions about it uh, so this is something that I th a very important thing to to work on during the next uh, years, uh, and also yeah, there are of course we have uh, our models are quite sensitive, so they may be cases that are uh, that there is this problem there, but they may be over highlighted, eh? so they may be over emphasized. Uh, so we will. What we are doing in these cases is that we are uh, collaborating with the company. And we are digging deeper to identify what this problem, what this emerging issue was, which uh, was the region. If we have other data that we can uh, utilize to confirm this issue, so these are the the actions that we are doing when we see these kind of uh, things that are not very clear are, are there red flags or green flags but it may happen yeah no many thanks for that and i mean thank thanks for all of those uh, um, um answers so maybe just to wrap up we'll, we'll quickly go on to i mean the reflections vera richard and maybe a few myself no um i just wanted to mention a couple of few things uh in it's probably more a call for action i think we are here um, un unlocking something incredible for, for food safety and quality in terms of application and the benefits that AI can bring us. But really my call for action, I don't think that we will go far if we don't have the right um, early adopters in our leadership community who actually are interested in playing with it interested in doing some real life pilots uh, with companies like Agrino 
And the more we do that, the better our prediction, accuracy of the prediction is going to be. And also we are gonna together, we'll be able to evolve this machine learning to the levels that we want, um, we want to. And second, I think it's really important that we continue to drive webinars like these because we need to continue to educate our public about the data and analytics in general and AI and um, remove some fears that I see they're very, um, very real. And final, final food for thought. Um, I really think that this is predictive analytics is the missing piece for us that will allow us as business as businesses to make more accurate predictions or decisions. And if you think of it, this community actually the the precision of our decisions will mean reduction of recalls or creating a safer food supply supply for our consumers. So. It's a big deal. I believe in this in this tool and really hope that we can partner up as, as leaders of the safety and quality community. Thank you, Vera. And Richard. Oh, thanks, Chris. So some of the reflections I, I put together and to your to your previous point on uh, sharing data anonymously, I think there are already initiatives where, where this is starting in, in Finn, for example. But I think we, we can only grow that. I think that's so important. And going back to what we did in, in Food Drink Europe, at least um, in the um, activities we have there, we, we put together some of the data on, on furan and, and chlorate and, and water. Again, going back to water, and we really shared that information. And I think that's really key so that um, also the public understands, you know, what are, what are the risks, what, what are the hazards that we find and how are they interpreted. So the data has to be definitely generated and shared much, much more. And I think that's something we will we'll definitely look at because at the end of the day, you know, food safety, we, we're all interested in food safety. We want food to be safe. And uh, it's not something uh, which is proprietary or which is confidential. I think it's important that we share anonymously. This is key. And then you build those larger data sets. And then, of course, your, your models will be far more accurate than predictions. So that, that data quality I put down because we've seen examples and cases where this is really lacking. And we, we would like to dig a bit more deep into some of the sources. Verification that requires, of course, um, industry concerted actions, but possibly to, to verify and to look at those early indicators, this is important because it's part of an early warning tool, essentially. So we want to react fast. You can test. It's not always too expensive. You see things happening. But again, it's uh, time is of the essence here because uh, it can easily spiral out of control if, you, if you're not acting uh, fast and you're not looking at your sources and understanding how to mitigate at the end of the day. Decisions uh, taken to these considerations, I think what you've shown, this, this definitely flows into how we basically uh, do a risk classification of materials. So it's essential in HSCCP studies, finally after verification eh, in, a, in a broader context. And then some of those parameters may even flow into RMPS, the raw material purchase specifications. I mean, of course, mineral oils will be in a purchase specification as normal. And as you dig deeper and you go into uh, ways to, uh, to manage, you, you can uh, set a purchase specification. And then of course, uh, funneling it into a contaminants of ends plan, which uh, you, you shouldn't do once every year. You should really do it more frequently to see uh, that you um, really capture those hazards or those risks, let's say, which uh, which are popping up in, in real time and that you can react to those accordingly. So monitoring and, and surveillance plans, this is where that information flows into. And then finally, it will if you have a strategic research program in, in food safety, that will obviously in some cases, and in our case, definitely some of these contaminants are on our programs, uh, which can span from, from short three months, six months, up to up to a year or even two years to understand um, how we can manage them and how we can, can mitigate. Because at the end of the day, you want to you see a risk in terms of food safety compliance, you've got, you've got to drive it down. And that's where, of course, you, you need uh, heavy resources. But again, where resources can be shared through Horizon 2020 programs and, and others. And I think they also, we need to do a lot more in terms of research together uh, with the different actors uh, in the space. Richard, that's uh, really very, very helpful. Thank you for that. So I guess uh, we're a couple of minutes over now. So I'm just going to wrap up in, in terms of, of, of where we are. I think, you know, the progress that has been made over the past three years, and I think it's been very well demonstrated in terms of 
the models that have, are being built are becoming more and more robust, more and more reliable. And, and certainly it is proving to be, you know, a really important and insightful tool in trying to predict what issues are, are, are coming short term and, and longer term as well. And I think also the um, what we've tried to do during the, this webinar is this process of demystification, <laughs> you know, what is this black box that gives out, uh, out information? I think Vera touched on it really well. You know, training is very, very important. Th th this is a new skill. This, this, is, this is something, you know, that we want to add into our, our, our ways of being able to manage things. And it will only come about through standardization and, and validation. And, and, and again, you know, I think on behalf of Agrino, the more people, the more companies that become involved in this, the more reliable the data becomes, and it becomes, you know, shared shared issues in, in ways that food industry really quite struggles to do. I think the cases that that were provided today by by Giannis, I mean, were, were, were quite excellent. So I think if you allow me just to kind of a very, very quick summary, just to finish up with, as I look through you know, this presentation, and I, you know, I, I'm lucky because I've, I've looked at it several times now, what I can see in my mind is I can see all of those things as a professor of, of food security that we talk about every day. We're seeing the impacts of climate change here. We are seeing the impacts of the Ukraine war. We're seeing the impacts of fraud because I can see fraud and, and food safety. It, it, they're, they're, they're cutting across each other. So we have a very, very complex global food supply system. We know now that it is really showing to have frailties because of the pressures it has been put under. And, and some risks, we do not know what are coming. And, and again, in, in the chat box, I could see people say, this happened 20 years ago, and exactly right. But, but for many of us, our memory isn't that good, and we forget about there was a massive issue in salmonella and chocolate 20 years ago, and here it comes back again. So I think the the um, the, the validation of, of of the issues that are coming, I, I think to me are very very strong. And I'd just like to finish off with: Do we really need to fully understand how predictive analytics works to trust it? When's the last time you watched your TV and you saw a weather prediction, and the weather prediction said tomorrow the weather is going to be horrible? and do then is you change what you're going to do tomorrow. Do you actually know how that weather prediction was made? I don't, but I trust it. <laughs> so with that, I would like to thank, absolutely thank the, the panel that we have today, Richard, Vera, Janice. I think, I think the information, the insight, absolutely fantastic. I want to thank you all for that. And I want to thank the, the audience for joining us today. I think it, the questions really shows the interest in the topic. So wherever you are in the world, Take the rest of the day or the rest of the night off. Don't worry too much because, you know, predictive analytics will be there to solve your problems. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.